Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, SBA 7A504 and Microloan Debt Relief Program. We'll give folks a few moments to jump on and get settled, and I'll go through some housekeeping items. I'm your moderator, Renee Gunno from the New York Small Business Development Center. Your host today is the Pace University Small Business Development Center, and joining us to talk briefly about the SBDC and introduce our presenters is Center Director Andrew Flam. I'll turn things over to Andrew to introduce our panel. Thanks so much, Renee. I really appreciate it. And good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, so my, my name is Andrew Flam. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center at Case University, and I'm really uh, glad you all could join us this morning. I think this is going to be a really engaging session, and we're really delighted to be able to work with uh, kind of the, the wide range of panelists we have today. Um, I wanted to sort of talk briefly about kind of who the Small Business Development Center network is. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with us or have not worked with us before, how hopefully we can help you um, as you uh, build and grow your business venture. Um, first off, we're part of a network of 22 centers located wide, um, offering targeted one-on-one -on -one business advisory assistance to entrepreneurs who either uh, are looking to build, grow, or expand uh, their small business venture. So, um, you know, we work with both existing business owners, those looking to uh, transition from, let's say, you know, more of a uh, um, kind of a side hustle you're trying to about how to formalize and expand that business, as well as, you know, traditional startups. So these are the folks that we work with uh, day in, day out, you know, industries. Um, and as I said, we have centers located uh, throughout the state. All of our services are offered at no cost, so we're hoping that for those of you who are not working with a business advisor as of yet, uh, that you do take advantage of um, these free services and be able to connect with us. Um, we have business advisors available throughout the state working virtually, uh, being able to kind of work with you one-on-one, -on -one, and our hope is that in the very near future we'll be able to see all your uh, faces kind of in person again at our various campuses. Um, so, uh, the, the areas that we work in really focused on um, access to finance, which is obviously near and dear to a lot of the clients that we work with, and we're uh, you know, very pleased to have some, some great speakers today that I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but there are other areas that we work on as well, sort of thinking about marketing and sales opportunities, you know, how to build and grow your website and online presence, thinking about lead generation, how to be able to kind of look at and find uh, new opportunities, uh, whether it's your government uh, procurement, you know, where uh, you're looking at different certifications that may be in place through the SBA, um, various uh, minority and women business enterprise certifications that may help you. Um, you're really looking forward to kind of, you know, and then developing capability statements. Think about opportunities as to how we can help you um, access these, these new contracts and, and be able to expand your business. Um, also kind of looking at, at different you know, issues that are in place really uh, post-COVID, thinking about, um, you know, how to be able to kind of re-envision, um, you know, what you are as a business and how you're operating, you know, whether you need to be able to transition, you know, more of your brick and mortar operations to kind of an e-commerce capacity, thinking about how to um, kind of adjust you know, how you're reaching your target market as that may have changed. So really being able to kind of Sit down with and, and connect and, and be able to dig deeply into these issues uh, with you know trusted um, you know in a, uh, in a in a in a confidential manner I think has really been very very impactful. So again, hoping that you all will uh, work with us if you have not uh, been already, and I'll be uh, playing into the chat link where you can find out a, a link that will kind of get you uh, a connection to those one-on-one -on -one business advisement sessions. We'll also be adding to the chat, um, we as a network offer a wide range of, of training programs, uh, nearly all of them, you know, free of charge. You know, so whether they're kind of deep dive, uh, you know, topics such as this, where we're looking at a specific uh, set of lending programs, it might be other issues, accounting uh, best practices, it might be, you know, sort of social media efforts, or looking at kind of ways for you to be able to dig into a particular topic uh, whether led by you know, one of our um, centers directly or whether we bring in uh, industry experts as we're doing today. So um, I'll be uh, putting into the chat also a link that you can uh, provide and, and be able to sort of see where you can be able to get registration for all those sessions. Um, the third and final item that I'll reference is obviously is that we're here to help. Uh, on the screen there presently, you do see there's an email address 
uh, that will kind of come directly to our office. I'll put that that as well, as well as a link to our website where we have um, a list of the wide range of um, uh, COVID uh, recovery programs that are in place, um, many from the federal government, but also some from the state and the city as well, uh, for those of you dialing in here in New York City. So that's kind of, kind of an overview of kind of who we are and what we do. Um, I should kind of, you know, uh, take note that, you know, while there are a wide range of, of, of COVID recovery programs, uh, two in particular, the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program are dynamite resources, um, certainly programs that if you're an existing business owner, uh, you can and should explore taking advantage of. Those are not going to be topics that we're going to be addressing today. Um, we want to make sure that we kind of focus on uh, some other program resources that are available for you uh, and hopefully you can take advantage of as well. All that to say, um, if you do have questions on PPP or IDLE uh, or the Shutter Venue Operators Grant Program that's coming um, and other you know, questions you may have, um, please do feel free to email uh, the SPDC at pace.edu. That email address is on uh, the screen presently. And you can also put those questions into the chat and we'll uh, address that offline. But again, today's focus is going to be on uh, the 78504. All right, so that's uh, kind of a brief uh, synopsis of kind of who we are and hopefully what we we'll cover today. Um, first off, I guess before I, I, I kind of dig more deeply into it, I just, first wanted to thank uh, Beth Goldberg, uh, who's the district director of the New York City District Office of the SBA, and um, her colleague Robin Daniels. And Robin and I have worked on a, a range of, of programs like this. And first of all, I just want to thank you both uh, for your continued uh, partnership and collaboration. It's great being able to bring events like these together. Um, so first of all, I guess just to kind of level set um, to kind of figure out kind of who's on the call with us today. We have one quick. Uh, survey question where we're curious and hopefully, thank you, Renee. Here's a snapshot of the uh, talented and, and very attractive um, you know, speakers that you'll have today. So I wanted to make sure you have a chance to see them both in person as well as the, on the screen. Uh, but I do have one quick question. I guess we're curious um, to know uh, from you all today uh, as we're talking about the 7A uh, 504 and microloan programs, if you could just answer this one quick question, let us know you've applied for you know, and or taken advantage of these programs before, you know, as these programs are going to be available both to uh, existing uh, businesses as well you know, for prospective ones. It's always curious for kind of who's uh, on uh, with us today. So if you that quick question, that would be very helpful. They are rolling in. Folks are voting quickly. We'll leave it open for another second. All right. I'm going to share the results if you can't see them for any reason. 11% said yes and 89% said no. Great. Thanks, Renee. So that's helpful. I mean, this program, I think it just kind of gives a little context and helpful for the folks who are on the call today. Uh, for our panelists to kind of know, as I said, this is a program that's going to be accessible and available for businesses, um, you know, who uh, took out these loans pre-COVID, but also businesses that may be interested in doing that now so for contact purposes. Um, I, I thought that was really helpful. So very much, everybody, for answering that. Um, all right, so that's, um, I guess, what I was hoping to cover now. What I'd like to do is... Uh, all we have rather than kind of do introductions for all of the lenders here um i'm just going to do a brief introduction to uh or turn that floor over to beth goldberg again the district director of the new york uh, district office for the sba and uh she'll uh, kind of kick things off and then she will get engaged with our three lenders today um uh, who are brianna brandon from um santander bank james vania from pursuit lending and Len Ostrowski from Company Capital. So again, thank you all for being part of this and uh, thank you again to Beth and Robin for your partnership and Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm really happy to be joining everyone today and talking about you know current financing and opportunities that currently exist. Um, we have a great panelist of lenders, and um, what I want to do today uh, before they begin and give you all this great information about um, 
how you can finance your business during the pandemic with uh, our tools. Um, I want to remind people uh, of two things, uh, three things. First of all, the New York District and the office and the resources here are serviced by uh, our district um, is the 14 downstate counties in New York, and we uh, service all of New York City, Nassau and Suffolk, and the Lower Hudson Valley, um, Sullivan, Putnam, Ulster, Duchess, and uh, Rockland, Orange, and Westchester. And together that comprises the largest field office in the United States for the Small uh, Business Administration. Uh, of about 14 million uh, members of the public and 1.6 million small businesses. So we have a quite robust district and we are still the finance capital of the world. And uh, we're happy to uh, be able, you're part of the small business you know, community of this wonderful ecosystem uh, that New York provides for businesses. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't spend two minutes on programs that we're not talking about today, but to remind people, our economic, in, economic in, uh, disaster loan, injury disaster loan, uh, 313,000 businesses in the state of New York, uh, they're, they're outstanding 313,000 loans, and um, payments that are, are um, Payment, there, there's a, a deferral period on the payments. For loans made prior to this disaster, they uh, are extending the payments to uh, any time in March when your payment in 2022 is due. And for loans made in 2020 due to the COVID uh, pandemic disaster, loans made in 2020 are being extended one year and 2021 extended 18 months. And the reason this is important is that it provides cash flow to your business at this current time. And it's very important for you if you have an existing loan. Uh, dating back anywhere in the last 30 years, uh, the biggest one is from 2012 from Sandy. You're entitled to these benefits. But if you are a business who are on an automatic payment system, you must be proactive and contact the SBA either by phone or through your internet portal bill and request that um, the uh, uh, loan payments be deferred. Um, the other thing is, is there's a lot of rumors out there about PPP. Right now, we have no information that they will be extended past March 31st with a lot of lenders uh, closing their portals before that day. Please don't wait to the last minute on March 31st to apply for a PPP unless you hear of something about an extension. Um, and uh, there's money left and lenders are, are uh, doing those loans. So like Andrew said, contact the SBDC if you want specifics. Um, but lenders are closing their portal early because it's not like the first round where they send something to SBA and SBA clicks yes. They are they are in a deeper review in this period, um, and banks uh, or lenders need their an opportunity to be able to get those codes and your loans approved. So um, uh, SBA will be approving loans until midnight on 11:59 uh, p.m. I don't want to be quoted wrong on, on March 31st, but the uh, lenders need to get their stuff in before. And with that, um, we'll start with Brianna. Uh, you can uh, introduce yourself and uh, talk about, you're going to be talking today, I believe, about the 7A program, correct? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brianna Brandon. I am an SBA sales officer at Santander Bank. Um, I've been with the bank for about two and a half years, and prior to that, I worked for about five years at community development financial institutions, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. Uh, but essentially, my role at the bank is to help our relationship managers and our frontline sales uh, colleagues to find opportunities for SBA lending and to really uh, utilize these programs to their fullest extent. 
um, and ensure that customers reap the full benefits of SBA lending programs, whether it be by providing a lower down payment to purchase a property or extending a term on a loan or being able to finance um, an industry that we typically would not uh, be able to because it falls outside of our strike zone, if you will, uh, as far as risk appetite is concerned. So SBA is a really, really vital uh, resource that I um, provide education around and just support on um, for our credit shop and our sales folks. And so um, as Beth had mentioned, you know, this past year really has been uh, PPP dominant. Um, it's not the only SBA program by any stretch though, but it is a lot of people's, you know, uh, I guess their introduction to SBA. Uh, and so we are here to let you know that there's a whole lot more to SBA beyond uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and one of the sort of hallmarks of SBA lending is their 7A program, uh, which is what I predominantly focus on at Santander. Uh, so SBA 7A lending uh, includes express loans, uh, which can be both lines of credit and term loans. Um, and it includes SBA seven micro loans, and uh, you can also provide SBA standard seven A loans. We work with other partners on other SBA programs. However, seven uh, A and seven A Express in particular are really kind of the dominant programs um, for some time there, uh, primarily because they require you know not quite as much underwriting and as a preferred lender Santander is able to uh, provide these forms of capital quickly uh, and it's versatile right it's sort of like a Swiss army knife in that it can be a line of credit a term loan equipment financing etc um, so it fits a lot of needs um, and another thing I'll mention about the express program just sort of generally uh, you might have heard an SBA guarantee fee so SBA Express loans are guaranteed at 50%, which ultimately means a lower fee for you. So think of the fee as like loan insurance for the bank, but um, the fee itself is dependent on how much is guaranteed. So lower fees for Express, that's why we do a lot of that type of lending. Um, and then one thing that is very relevant right now is the uh, SBA section, or I'm sorry, the CARES Act, Section 1112 Debt Relief Payments. So that's just a jargony term for SBA is paying money, uh, SBA is paying the debt for uh, 7A loans and 504 loans, which Jimmy will talk about later. Uh, so if you were to take out uh, a 7A loan or a 504 loan, uh, right now, you could get up to three months of debt relief payments on those loans. Um, and if you already have an SBA loan, then you potentially received six months of debt relief um, earlier on in the pandemic and another two months right now or up to another five months. There are different categories. It breaks down in a lot of uh, ways, but the ultimate sort of message here is that uh, if your business is looking for capital, looking for growth beyond the, the band-aid that PPP might have provided, uh, then you should really consider these programs because you'll be given an extra buffer um, of you know, that time that you wouldn't have to pay payments, SBA is making those payments on your behalf um, so that you can you know, really start to ramp right back up again. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into more of the details around this, but uh, I'll leave it at that. And again, my name is Brianna I'm with Santander. Thanks. Thanks, Brianna. So, you know, uh, people out there should think about the three months if you get a new loan, like, you know, when you go and rent an apartment these days, the landlords are being very competitive with uh, offering you free rent for a certain amount of months. So, you know, SBA again is a cash flow lender, and interest rates and fees are. Um, important, but we look to see whether you can sustain that monthly payment. And we give you longer terms, and sometimes we have higher fees because your loans are riskier. And we help the bank, the guarantee helps the bank uh, turn not a, a no into a yes, but a maybe. 
So I always like to say, if you look through the stack, you know, the banks are probably comfortable with the top 20% of lenders, 20% of loans that are presented to them. And then there's this other tranche that they're not sure, and that's where the SBA comes in to help. And for the rest of the people, they need to go to a resource partner and figure out their business plan and their financials. And all these lenders that are on uh, sharing the platform today work with organizations like Andrews at uh, the, the Pace University Small Business Development Center to help move you up that chain to get into uh, a loan and lending and help your business expand and grow. So um, thank you, Rihanna. And uh, let's move to James now, who's going to talk about our other flagship program and the benefits during COVID of 504. So James, you're up. Uh, you're up. Sure. So good morning, everybody. First, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, everybody that's here for all of us getting together. And hopefully, I, I look forward to being able to do this in person at some time. Um, so my name is Jimmy Vigna. I work for an organization called Pursuit. Uh, we're formerly known as the New York Business Development Corporation. So we are a New York State chartered bank that's been around since 1955. Uh, however, we are not a deposit-based institution, uh, nor do we provide a uh, line of credit facilities. We are strict, strictly a transactional lender that focuses primarily on the SBA 7A, 504, and a, a number of other SBA loan programs. Now, within that, uh, my particular focus is the SBA 504 loan program. So that is for the acquisition and or improvement of owner-occupied commercial real estate, uh, as well as the purchase of machinery and equipment. So when I say owner-occupied commercial real estate, I mean that you, your business, would be occupying at least 51% or more of the project property space. Um, in the most typical of circumstances, the 504 program allows a business owner to access 90% financing. So structurally, the way that that works is that because this is a partnership program, uh, there would be a 50% first mortgage taken by a participating third-party lender such as Santander, uh, us, Pursuit would be providing a 40% second mortgage. Uh, you, the borrower, are responsible for 10% of the total project costs. So that's not just the acquisition, as I was saying before, it could be the renovations, the furniture, the fixtures, the equipment. Uh, picture it as one giant bucket to lump all of these costs in, and the borrower will be responsible for 10% of that total project cost. So simple math, million dollar project, a borrower would have to come up with $100,000 as opposed to you know, more than double that under a regular conventional circumstance. So the whole idea of the program really in the simplest form is to allow a business owner to be able to acquire a long-term asset like a machinery or building, uh, which is usually associated with either expanding, launching, or relocating, uh, while keeping as much cash as humanly possible in the business, right? Primarily to preserve working capital. Um, the, in terms of a rate and term standpoint, it is fixed for the entirety of the life of the loan with either a 20-year term and a 20-year amortization or a 25-year term with a 25-year amortization, um, both of which are fully fixed for the life of the loan, self um, fully, fully amortizing, self-liquidating with no balloon payment. Um, specific to uh, what Brianna was saying before, there are also uh, similar benefits that are being provided under 504 loans that have either been already closed and funded prior to the pandemic uh, and then ones that were um, have been funded throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, amongst many other benefits that the program has, uh, it's important to note that on, on our portion of the transaction, which is that 40% second mortgage, uh, you're actually not subject to the New York State mortgage recording tax of 2.8%. So just simple math, you know, that can add up pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the program is very versatile. Uh, it's been able to be used for everything from existing businesses that are, you know, hallmarks of New York City that probably many of you have heard of or visited uh, to start up businesses that are just looking to get, you know, get their feet on the ground. So you know, more or less how the program works. Thanks, James. Can mm -hmm. can you go over a little bit more about um, two things, the rate like sure. that, uh, with those terms, right, 20, 25 years? And, mm -hmm. um, and can you tell us a story about, you know, how during COVID, uh, can you, an example of a client, how the debt relief programs helped uh, you know, a, a client during COVID? 
Sure. So uh, in terms of, let me address the, the rate question first. So wh when I say that the rate is fixed for the entirety of the life of the loan, without going super deep into the mechanics, the way that the program is funded is through a monthly bond sale on the secondary market. So once a month, Goldman Sachs packages up all the 504s across the country and sells them on the secondary market. That's how the loan is able to be fixed for the entirety of its life for our portion. Um, currently, off the top of my head, the the 25 year term rate would be 3.05 percent right now, and the 20 year term I believe is a flat three or 3.01. I just want to check my notes real quick, but yeah, because I, I was just looking at the rate sheet we had right before this started. So um, again, the the whole idea is that you're able to acquire this long term fixed rate financing to be able to purchase a you know a a long-term asset. Um, the rate does, because it is based on bond sale, the rate is determined once per month at the time of said bond sale. So I know that could be a, a little concerning to a borrower when they see a commitment letter that doesn't have a rate on it, right? But uh, the reason for that is that because of the way that the program is structured, uh, that rate is determined based at the time of the, of the closing and funding of the loan. Now, what we're able to do is because the loan is based, the, the the bond is based off of the 10-year treasury. It's pretty stable and it doesn't really fluctuate all that much. So we would be able to provide somebody with a, a lengthy historical rate sheet that shows what the rates have been over the last, you know, let's say five years. So you can kind of get an understanding of, of that there's not massive fluctuations. Um, now, in terms of the second part of the question regarding the, the CARES Act payments, I mean, the, the list of stories is a little long. So I have uh, a borrower of mine who owns a small restaurant in Staten Island, uh, owns a secondary location in Astoria, a uh, Mexican restaurant called Maizal. Uh, they've been around since 2008, uh, right after the borrower had first came to the United States. He encountered the Great Recession, so right off the bat, he was already facing a lot of challenges. But fast forward to now, uh, not only was he able to uh, obtain a PPP loan to save both uh, Maisal in Astoria as well as Staten Island, uh, he also utilized the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, too, to be able to help him fund the additional day-to-day -day expenses aside from payroll. Uh, unfortunately, as many hospitality businesses can easily attest to, They've been taking a lot of hits over the last year, right? So uh, not only has this been able to keep his business and his employees together, um, uh, um, uh, Leo, the owner, has been able to be able to bring one of his siblings over here from, from his, his home country to be able to not only work here, but also get um, ownership within the business through the HP5 visa program. So without both the SBA 504 loan program, as well as the debt payments, he wouldn't have been able to survive during this time. Because uh, he was not a you know a fast casual takeout restaurant, he was a full service sit down restaurant, and as we all know, limited capacity is hard. So his 504 was done during COVID, and he had the 100 percent use. Mm -hmm. yes. Twenty. That was what I was really getting at. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, yes. He did. He did obtain the 504 during uh, during COVID. Um, he was able to obtain the first round of the full six months of payments for the debt service uh, for the debt relief, and then he's also going to be able to get the additional ones now too. So he's you know, he's really really benefiting from it, and honestly, it's probably what kept him in business. Okay, terrific. Um, one thing I want to comment on is uh, James said he wasn't a depository lender. They don't have branches all around the city in, the, their, in their service area. Um, when people go online and search for SBA loans, they have to be really careful not to get involved with predatory lending. And people who have a .com versus a .gov or .org or, um, uh, you know, people pay for those uh, search engine op optimizations where you will think that you are contacting the SBA and um, although our rates are a little higher than normal they're not outrageous so please 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 be careful and um, I think Pursuit has a portal uh, for their um, loan programs that yes. don't give don't give you cash automatically but accept an app application to be reviewed um and brianna will get back to you about how if you ha do you have an online portal as well or 
we're working towards that currently it's a lot of uh yeah email through um security email etc but uh yes soon to come soon to come <laughs> thanks now we'll turn to leonard about uh, our micro lending program so uh leonard take it away uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting us for this important uh, panel. Uh, the, a company capital formerly known as Business Center for New Americans, and we've been around for the last 23 years, uh, specializing in lending, business lending to immigrants and refugees. And uh, as it was in our uh, first name, uh, Business Center for New Americans, and it is reflected in our new name, a company. We accompany our uh, customers and, and regardless of the old technology we're using, we are high touch uh, agency. We speak to our clients, we talk to them and on all the programs. So uh, our main program is a micro SBA micro loan from as little as 500 to fix credit and to repair credit to as much as 50,000 for more established businesses. <clears throat> Since COVID uh, phenomena started, we've been doing so-called emergency loans. We uh, thought, how can we help our uh, clients? And it was initially just our clients uh, who struggled. So it was basically character-based lending uh, with less of uh, underwriting. So we, during the 2020, we underwritten 112 loans for half, uh, one and a half million. And it was like about 22% of our portfolio. Uh, we, we, we were doing a lot of uh, uh, scenario planning uh, and we're thinking how much of a losses we will sustain uh, uh, during this uh, uh, result of the COVID-19. Uh, and thanks to SBA, all our, all our uh, calculations uh, proved to be wrong. It's much lower our, uh, uh, and why? Because SBA is paying making those payments to our clients and currently uh, 277 loans on our portfolio are being paid by SBA. Uh, 269 loans, uh, micro loans and eight community advantage, which is a smaller version of 7A loans. So it's a total uh, uh, about like 3 million in, in, in payments we're receiving from SBA and it's an incredible help. Uh, uh, there, there are qualifications to uh, qualify for that loan. It should be given through an SBA fund and, and certain timing. Uh, and in new loans that we are processing right now, uh, qualifying for a few months of uh, uh, SBA uh, uh, payment. So this is an incredible opportunity uh, and SBA is uh, doing a great job. And regardless of this, some people asking, what is SBA? Even our clients, what is SBA? So, but it's, it, that's, that's uh, uh, we are doing a lot of work educating them and sending them emails and calling them and explaining the incredible opportunity that is available right now. So SBA is everyone's Uncle Sam that, you know, they go to for a loan or some money to help them start, right? They're, uh, they're better than the uh, bank of mom and dad. Um, so, Leonard, could you talk a little bit about your size of your loans, your sweet spots, what you're doing right, you know, has it changed because of the pandemic? And you said that you were lending based on character. So are you still using um, credit scores or, you know, can you go into like what's happening right now? Uh, when I mentioned character, it was to our, uh, it was related to our existing clients who already proved their ability to pay in character. But uh, in general, so we uh, we uh, obviously uh, checking their credit and 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 see uh, see whether they are paying other obligations. But it's extremely important to calculate whether they will be able to meet these monthly payments. And we, uh, for that, we do full underwriting. We check their, their service, business, and personal, and see whether they will be able to make those payments, monthly payments. Okay, so as about, I mentioned- What about the new people that are on the line today? 89% of the people who are listening who want to uh, start or grow their business with you. 
we do we do accept new applications we do uh, we do accept new applications and and again so if we're going back to 2020 we thought how would we be able to uh underwrite new loans uh, when we were uh, opening to uh new loans lending again so so in addition to uh all those criteria that we had we also added like uh industry criteria like example would be travel agencies hard hit hard very hard to to lend to those guys or venues or like uh, uh at that moment restaurants were hit hard so we, we would go specifically and evaluate each and every each and every case case by case but let's say we we knew that for example good industry that work well in 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 this new environment electric bikes they were uh very much in demand so so we would do a little more research see how this particular industry is doing in this new environment and whether that particular business owner uh, has uh, a contingency plan so we we uh, uh included in our underwriting criteria contingency plan uh that is being used by banking industry we are not banking uh, institution but we 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 try to use uh good uh uh, lending uh, uh, approaches from other institutions. So, uh, an example of a new loan that we are now uh, uh, working on is a, a, a speech therapist that works with uh, uh, children with uh, special needs. He's been working for uh, uh, other agencies for a long time, but now there is an opportunity, more licenses are being uh issued so we're working on that new uh loan for of fifty thousand he's gonna he he's been working with the industry for for the uh recent 18 years so it's a startup but we are considering because he knows what to do he knows how to do so all that uh, takes into consideration and we're working on a new startup as i mentioned again so we, uh we uh, michael loans up to fifty thousand so this is our uh, top on, on, on SBA micro loans, and, and it can be small, very few, uh, very small loans. We have a lot of uh, mom and, uh, very small operators that still come to us and, and, and make payments in person. Less so now, we, you know, we, we, we had to do a lot of training how to use technology during the uh, uh, we, we became fully digital underwriters now, so less paper are being used. So there's very little paper, except SBA closing documents that still require to be uh, uh, signed in, in blue ink. Otherwise, it's all it's all digital. So this, okay. there's a lot of work with our clients, how to use uh, uh, DocuSign, or in our case, we're using Adobe e-signature, how to transfer documents even using WhatsApp and other applications. So our loan officers did a lot of work because we all uh, took, and, and we meet with our clients like using Zoom and all that. Okay, great. So for for everyone out there, um, a company capital is a micro lender. So SBA actually funds them with a check and then they re-lend our money uh, at a higher interest rate than maybe conventional, right? And, uh, but they give you a longer term and they uh, provide you with a credit history. And um, why should you get involved with a micro lender like a company? Because um, they're really operating in a realm that more traditional lenders would not be lending in. And it's their goal to graduate you to a bigger lender and take on new clients uh, when you get to yeah. a bigger company. You know. And also, I just want to say, we're not just micro lenders, we're also uh, community advantage lenders. And one of our micro loan just graduated and was approved for, for 250,000 uh, community advantage loans as we speak. So they just got uh, authorization from SBA. They quadrupled their sales uh, uh, during the pandemic, believe it or not. So believe it or not. So some businesses are doing pretty well. So. Uh, and also the fees and 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 interest rate was uh, fees were waived for this period and and the interest rate is much lower at this time as other colleagues other cdfis lower their interest rate and fees 
to help businesses to cope with this unprecedented difficult times. Thank you, Leonard. Um, so Andrew, I don't know where you are, but um, I'm going to ask a quick question of James and Brianna, and then we're going to be ready to take questions. So hopefully you're hearing me, even yep. though I can't hear you right now. So um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I hear the voice. So James um, if you, and Brianna, um, quickly, if you could give, uh, we talked about the interest rate, James, with you. If you and an example, can you just tell people what your sweet spot is? You know, um, in the type of real estate that we're looking at. I don't think we talked about you know the best benefit of the 50, 40, 10. Um, we're not talking about buying skyscrapers in Manhattan, but we are talking about condo space and in, in these buildings that have changed, which you know is a big. Uh, mission of mine as a uh, as district director to get into that condo uh, commercial condo and office market um, that was happening before the pandemic. So can you talk a little bit about your sweet spot? And then Brianna, we're going to come back to you for the same question. Okay. Sure. So in terms of a sweet spot, um, let, let's just start first with the, with the properties themselves. So just remember, 50, 51% owner occupancy, right? So obviously, as Beth was saying, you're not buying a 20-story skyscraper that you're occupying one floor of. Usually, the borrowers that we have are either purchasing the space that they're already in, which is usually like, uh, like somewhat of a mixed-use property. So you got a commercial level on the ground floor that may be a restaurant, retail store, some sort of other storefront uh, with one or two floors of residential apartments above. Uh, conversely, we do a lot of, um, uh, of wholesalers as well as manufacturers. Uh, just a fun historical fact about the 504 loan program. Uh, originally, one of its primary purposes was to be able to support businesses such as manufacturing to entice them, amongst other reasons, to stay in the United States by having ownership of their space. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of a sweet spot, um, I would say that there's, you know, a, a, there's not really a particular sweet spot that we have. And I say that because I personally have done everything from uh, a small restaurant that I was describing before to a large manufacturer of bolts for bridges that's up in the Bronx called Mako. So there, there really does want to run a very wide gamut. What I would say is our quote sweet spot is really understanding the credit and understanding the business and also understanding how that relates to the project. So it's one thing to purchase a property because like, hey, it's a good idea. I want to own a property to, you know, create generational wealth or collect rental income. That is not what the 504 program necessarily is for. Obviously, property ownership does create generational wealth. However, the primary purpose of the program is for the business to be able to have a stable home to operate from. So when I, when I say a sweet spot, I, I really, uh, I personally have a, a really good track record with contractors, manufacturers, restaurant owners. We do doctors and lawyers too, um, but really it's the, like the small business of small businesses. You know, to credit score? Sure, great question. So yes, so in terms of credit score, we don't really have a minimum. I mean, usually somewhere between 660 and 680. Let's be frank, if someone has a, a very damaged credit history and a score of like 500, it's probably not gonna work. However, uh, we have had borrowers that have credit scores from the mid sixes all the way up to 800. I've had borrowers that have had bankruptcies. I've had borrowers that are formerly incarcerated. Um, I always like to say to, to prospective borrowers who might be worried about something like that, it's that it's not what you did, it's what you did to rectify it. So, um, and, and, I, and I say that with uh, using a real life example of I actually just have a borrower right now who was approved by SBA uh, about three days ago, a large electrical contractor in Brooklyn who uh, filed chapter 11 bankruptcy about 10 years ago. Um, and we were able to explain to the SBA that, okay, everyone makes a mistake, look at what they've done since then. So I think our sweet spot is really being able to tell a borrower's story. Right. Right. And it's very important that, you know, uh, potential borrowers realize that we will find out. Right. So, <laughs> notice how said, we will find out. It's our job to find out. And um, it's better to just be up front and consider your lender a partner with you. 
they are lending into your business. They are going to be with you. They want to succeed. And as many people have heard me say, they do not want your house, your wife, your char, first child, your car, or any of that. They want you to be successful. So you need to be honest and you need to be knowledgeable about your business when you come and meet the lenders. And again, that's what the SBDC is for, to help you and prep you for those meetings should you need it. So it's always good. Uncle Sam not only provides money, but he pays for all this free counseling. So uh, use it, it's good for you. So Brianna, um, if you could go over your sweet spot and you know credit scoring sure. and we'll go to questions. No problem. Um, well, I guess first I did just want to reemphasize that point you'd made. It's so important that you are candid with your lender. Uh, you're saving yourself time. It, everyone benefits. You're saving yourself time. You're saving the lender time. Um, and if it turns out that whatever it is that might not have been disclosed is something that is truly a gating factor for you know you getting financing from whatever lender, you want to know that early on, right? You don't want to get two weeks into the process and month in and have um, you know, your application decline only once something is uncovered. So save yourself the time, the due diligence, and uh, just because one lender might see it as a, uh, a restriction or reason that unfortunately we can't provide financing, that doesn't mean that all lenders will. So all the more reason to just that out in the open and then find a lender that you can work with, right? So um, similar to Jimmy, Santander doesn't necessarily have a sweet spot, sweet spot per se, but um, we work with a lot of professional businesses. Uh, we work with a lot of restaurants for SBA, a lot of contractors. Um, and I would say that if you are in the early stages of your business or if you're looking to acquire a business, um, then come prepared with your financial statements, your business plan, and you're going to hear a lot of people say this if you attend a lot of these events, uh, have your resume prepared and understand the ins and outs of your industry. Uh, because the first question that I always ask when uh, one of the relationship managers I work with asks about a startup is how much experience do they have? Um, I mean, it's imperative that you are uh, knowledgeable about whatever skills it takes to run the business successfully and or you have someone that you are bringing on to the team or maintaining on the team if you are acquiring a business that uh, knows the ins and outs, the operations. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I guess as a, uh, an FDIC, you know, a bank, financial institution, we are a bit more regulated than CDFIs. Uh, so that means our credit box is a little bit smaller than CDFIs. So our minimum credit score is a little higher, it's 700. Um, and we do look to your personal assets if we are, uh, if we do need further collateral for the loan. Um, so, I mean, things to bear in mind, but at the end of the day, like if you are able to, uh, you know, demonstrate that you have sufficient capital injection to put into a new venture and that you know, uh, again, the ins and outs of your industry, you put a plan in place for the first couple of years, you know how the first year will look, or at least you have some strong or uh, well thought and articulated assumptions around how it will look, then you're in a great spot. Um, this past year, we funded a pharmacy, uh, which I mean, they are in sort of the enviable, enviable position of being in an industry that is very much in demand right now. However, when we closed the loan um, one year ago, about one year ago, uh, they were just starting out. It was a, a brand new startup pharmacy, um, and they were having, you know, a bit of trouble getting off the ground. The construction was down, you know, there was no way to get their build out completed uh, on the timeline that they initially anticipated. <laughs> But um, thanks to the SBA debt relief program, we were able to, you know, give them some comfort and not have to, uh, you know, defer payments all the way to the end of the loan. So these payments were kind of wiped out for them entirely, which is fantastic. Um, and really, based on their own due diligence and their uh, work and the effort that they had put into their application, they were one of the few startups that I've worked with. So few pre-revenue businesses that we were able to fund uh, because they had a very well thought business plan. They had done their market research, et cetera, and uh, really had a lot of skin in the game. 
So um, something to bear in mind this year if I get financing. Okay, thank you. Andrew, thank you everybody. It's been a great panel and Robin and I are here uh, to help uh, with any questions and Andrew, um, I don't see anything, so I'm gonna turn it to you to handle this part, okay? Terrific. Thanks, Beth, and thank you, Brianna, James, and Leonard. I really appreciate your insights. I think one quick takeaway I'm gonna kind of mention uh, before turning over to, to Renee for um, kind of further Q and A, just, you know, the, the, the storytelling aspect, I think, um, that, that James had mentioned, I think also kind of the, the preparation in terms of being able to make sure that you have an understanding of the assumption, you know, what the future is going to look like. For These are things that uh, small business center advisors work on with our uh, small business clients on a day in and day out basis. So just wanted to reiterate that we're here for you and um, not only are these programs beneficial, but also kind of as the speakers that kind of touched on are particularly impactful right now because you get that additional that relief you get those uh kind of number of months of uh you know waived principal and interest payments that help it make that much more affordable for you so um thank you all to the lenders and obviously to beth and robin uh for kind of guiding us through this and i think at that point um i will if that's okay and maybe let's get through some q a if we can Sounds good, and I'll bring up um, the presenters and the lenders slide just so folks um, have a, an idea again of who everyone is. Um, to kind of bounce off, Brianna, you were talking about startups. We had a question from a pre-revenue company, it's a biotech company, and they were curious if they could get one of these microloans, and it, it sounds like it would be a potential yes to that one. Is that correct? There are a ton of factors that play into sort of that yes, no decision. Uh, and so I, I'm hard pressed to ever say yes or no, um, but it's absolutely possible. Uh, we we don't necessarily specialize in micro lending at some time there. Uh, it's done, but probably not um, on the level that it is done at a company capital. And so, yeah, maybe I could turn that question over. Well, I guess it depends on uh, particulars of that particular company, whether they uh, know it and when they expect to, and, and their ability to pay, uh, repay, uh, when they're expecting to start generate uh, uh, cash flow. So it's, it's still, uh, it's, it's not a grant program, it's a loan program that had, is expected to be repaid. So there's a good time to apply now because of the rates are lower and the fees are waived, but still uh, we do full underwriting and evaluate their ability to repay. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter, for that question. If you have any follow-up, just let me know. We had tons of questions asking for folks' contact information and the best way to get a hold of folks. Um, I know at some of these companies, you might not be the um, best person to contact initially. I don't know if maybe you can put in the chat um, the, the best way for someone to reach out who wants to um, reach out to a specific company, if, if that makes sense for folks. Um, I also mentioned that you can email PACE and they can look at your question and, and get it to the right person there. Um, let's see, I think that covered quite a few of the questions. Um, we have someone who lives in New York, but they have um, property in Massachusetts. So they're looking for anything for property developers that are changing from commercial to residential. And I know this has been more focused on New York State, but they're wondering um, how they kind of find these services in, in other states. And I mentioned the, um, the resources uh, by zip code on the SBA's website, but if there's any other information you'd recommend um, for them to find programs in other states that might help them. So let me take that for a second. The SBA is national, uh, it's the federal government. We have 68 offices like the one in New York across the country, uh, the US Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Guam. Um, so if you go to our website, and um, I haven't done that, Renee, while I'm on here, um, and Robin, I don't know if you can type in you know, how you find a local district office 
and our resources. But all the programs that we talked about are available across the country, just that the lenders would probably be different. And um, there is also a lender portal where you could type in your zip code and find lenders so like, or a lender match. I guess we should talk about lender match. Um, you fill in a form for lender match and banks all across the country look at that. They're signed up in our program and you may get a call even from a bank in Utah or Nevada or Pennsylvania, even though you're located in Massachusetts. And let me ask the lenders on the line, do you guys use lender match? James yeah. does. Yes. James, can yes, you talk a little bit about how you use that? Sure. So um, what, what ends up happening is that a, a prospective borrower uh, would fill out a, a sim, pretty much a, a pretty standard, simple application of, hey, this is how long I've been in business for. This is what I'm looking to uh, do with financing. This is roughly the dollar amount that I'm looking for. And here's my contact information. So uh, that will then be routed to the um, the local SBA lending partners in the area. So for example, I actually happen to be the person that gets those lender match inquiries when, when they come to pursuit. So uh, what will happen is that I'll receive that information. Uh, I usually start with a phone call. Uh, if you don't answer, I'll shoot you an email afterwards. And just, just so you know, it's not like a scam phone call. I'll actually also include a copy of the lender match submission. Um, so, but yeah, it's, 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 it's been, um, it's usually pretty good. Um, and, and the volume has been pretty frequent. And I believe that the way that you ma you access SBA lender matches through the SBA site, correct? Correct. Yeah. correct. And we've made hundreds of thousands of matches on that site. So, and uh, when Robin types in or uh, Andrew how to find the local resources, the I don't even know how many small business development centers there are around the country. We have tens of thousands of SCORE volunteers and over a hundred women business development centers all around the country who are uh, providing the counseling, free counseling service to get you ready to enter the lender. So. Yeah, well, I guess, thank you, Beth. I guess while there are 22 um, small business development centers here in New York State, uh, there are almost a thousand SBDCs throughout the country. If you're Massachusetts based, there'd be kind of a comparable organization of the work that we're doing uh, to help you with your business venture there. Thank you. We definitely had a lot of questions on that lender match, so I'll, I'll pop that link in there. If, if Robin doesn't get to it first, I'll, I'll just have to shut down my slides for a second to jump to that. Um, all right. Um, I'm a prospective business owner looking for financing. Is my first step to work with the SBA who would connect me to a lender, or do I work with the lender who then connects me to the SBA program? So I would say the first step is to work with a small business development center or resource partner who will review your material and get you ready to work with the lenders. SBA, uh, uh, Think of us as a wholesale operation. Um, we work with the lenders to provide our guarantee or new prospective borrowers. We don't work directly. We, the SBA, me sitting in Federal Plaza, does not work with borrowers directly. We refer people to resource partners. We work very closely with Andrew, and they work with the appropriate banks. I always say this when I'm doing these live in-person presentations, you know, a woman would never buy a pair of black shoes without, you know, going to several stores to check out which pair of black shoes she really wants. There are over 2,000. There are, we've learned from PPP, there are over 5,000 lenders out there. Each lender has their own little niche market that they uh, are comfortable in either by size or industry or loan amount, um, territory. Um, so, so these expert business counselors can help advise you so that you're not constantly taking a hit to your credit score by going in and having a lender who's really not the appropriate lender for your needs um, or review your documents. So again, First step is these uh, resource partners located in your communities who will know the banking connections, who will use our guarantees to help you receive the news. 
Thank you. Um, and someone mentioned a possible forgivable SA loan, and they're not forgivable. Is that correct? Say that again. Or 7A, sorry, 7A loan. Someone asked about uh, a 7A loan being forgivable, and it's it's not forgivable, correct? It's not Just forgivable. PPP. The the interest right now, the cost of legislation passed by Congress, is waiving the requirement to make your payments on a new loan for three months, past for six months, while you are not making your payments, your interest is still accruing, and depending on your loan documents. The lenders can correct me if I'm wrong. Will determine the start of your loan payments, um, uh, and that's through the last piece of legislation that's known as the American Recovery Program that was signed on oh March 12th by the president. So, um, and as we know, all of us sitting up here, I don't know what reiteration of recovery. There's been many, and we're trying to keep everyone up to date on the new rules and regulations promulgated once Congress passes legislation on President signs. Thank you. Can you talk quickly about how the SBA 7A and the microloans are different from the New York Ford Loan Fund? I can jump in briefly on that. The New York Ford Loan Fund, a, a loan fund that's offered through New York State, Empire State Development is the state agency that handles that and there are a number of uh, community-based lenders um, who uh, process those loans. Those loans are targeted, um, you know, uh, and, and launched in effect, you know, for COVID-19 recovery programming. So, um, you know, we're happy to kind of work with our businesses and have, been, have a number of clients have been able to take advantage of that program. I know uh, Pursuit and others are kind of participating lenders in that program. Um, but uh, ultimately, you know, the, the focus of the, the programs today are federal lending programs that are available, you know, with these targeted efforts to help kind of waive you know, a number of months of, of payments, help you uh, access and, and make, uh, I think as Brianna may have mentioned, that's kind of a longer, you know, wrap up time, I think, in terms of being able to uh, access this very important, helpful term capital. Thank you. And we got some more questions on how to make an appointment. So I'll put that in again. Um, someone mentioned with an SBA representative. So the appointment would be with an SBDC a business advisor, and they would help you navigate the SBA programs. Um, we got a question asking, Beth, if the microloan program or the 7A will ever end. And we I know that's not. a hard one, but I think they're they're thinking about kind of some of the other programs out there that have a deadline to apply. Maybe just talk about how this one's different. So 7A has been authorized by Congress and funded by Congress uh, pre-pandemic. Um, I have a $31 billion credit line that Congress authorizes every year for 7A and I don't know, about $8 billion for 504, and uh, um, we are the largest uh, private lender. In, in, we are the largest lender with our capital, you know, coming from the uh, uh, United States government, our guarantee. Um, so um, 7A is not scheduled to end. Uh, Community Advantage is a pilot program that does have an end date in uh, uh, sometime in 2022, and we'll have to see what Congress does about that. So that takes our 7A program to our micro lenders to make them um, to make them eligible to do larger loans up to I think Glenn, if you do 250,000 is your max, right? I don't know what Pursuit yes. does to do 500,000. We're under yeah. years, right? So depending on their capital stack, their requirements, you know, to uh, be solvent, uh, the SBA makes certain determinations about how much money uh, they're able to lend. Um, so we've been around since President Eisenhower that formed us in the 50s, and uh, um, the programs that are um, uh, 
uh, you know, PPP is not envisioned to be a permanent program. That ends right now on March 31st. Um, that was a short-term need, but we have been making these other loans. Excuse me, Dan, you have to shut that off. Um, sorry. Um, uh, so these programs, uh, you know, are, I'm sorry. Hang on a second. You're fine. I'm surprised my dogs haven't barked yet. Huh? I'm surprised my dogs haven't barked yet. Oh. Um, anyway, uh, uh, um, my husband and I share a piece of equipment in at my office and, you know, anyway. Um, so The, the 504 and the 7A programs should be around for generations to come. That's the best way I could put it. Is that, it? Is that the best way to put it, right? So. I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Is a business with a current idle loan eligible for a 504 loan? Oh, absolutely. They, absolutely, they are. Uh, one important thing to note is that with the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or any of these other programs that someone accesses, just to step back for one second, that 10% down payment requirement, in particular, and I, and I want to make sure that everyone hears this, that if you do receive an idle loan and you decide to use an SBA 504 loan to purchase a property, you cannot utilize the proceeds from the EIDL loan to be able to fund your 10% down payment. That is an ineligible use of proceeds and in fact would make you ineligible on both loans. So um, just something to just think about and just remember, but yes, you can still get a 504. Yeah, just think about double dipping, you know, that it's gross and whatever. You cannot use the same funds, you know, have one, need and use multiple loans to fund the same thing. The idle is really, the economic injury loan is really for six months of working capital and not for the expansion of your business, so, which the 504 is for the expansion of your property and fixed assets and business. Thank you. And I know you talked a little bit about some scams that are out there. What are some more tips to figure out if it's a legitimate lender and not a scammer? <laughs> Listen, you, <laughs> Brianna's laughing. Um, I think typically the less they ask, the the shadier it is. Um, so I mean, that's my general rule of thumb. Uh, if you are not prompted to provide much or any information on business, your financials, your uh, business's financials then it likely is a program or a scam and you will end up uh, paying a much higher rate than you had anticipated or than was like, disclosed up front um, on the tail end. Uh, pay attention to rates. I mean, it's probably somewhere in some maybe 0.4 text at the bottom, but uh, read it because it could be telling you that this 5% uh, rate is 5% per week. Right, so those are the details that might catch you. Um, and that's, yeah, that's generally my, right. uh, my thought on that. All right, okay. so if you use the Small Business Development Center, they will tell you who the lender is at, you know, Santander, at Chase, at Citibank, at t and at, you know, Axiom, um, just so that, you know who you're dealing with. Um, SBA's websites all end in .gov, uh, except for our policy map on IDLE, uh, which is sbaidle.policymap.com because we hired a contractor to put that together for us and they operate it. But all the information, um, if you go to sba.gov, there's a huge banner, yellow banner, does it change, Robin? It says coronavirus on it, and you click that, and it opens up everything that you know you can need. No, it's still there. Okay, thanks. No. Thank you. We had a few questions come in um, from e-commerce platforms that were wondering if they qualify for these loans, um, and folks at brick and mortar that are going to online businesses. Is that an area that you guys have been lending to? 
Okay. I'm, I'm actually doing one right now for a place in Brooklyn that was a brick and mortar party and gift shop for a number of years, but over the last three or four years has pivoted to online and e-commerce sales, uh, primarily through Amazon. So yeah, I, we're, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, that definitely answers quite a few folks who are curious about the e-commerce element um, and online businesses only. Um, so we had a question, a few come in about um, the portal for PPP forgiveness um, and when banks will open that up for applying. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the PPP on this one. Um, definitely, I would recommend you I would definitely recommend again contacting an advisor um, to see what's going on with your application and they can kind of help you navigate the best path for your with your bank. Um, Patrick had a good question just to make sure he understood this correctly. So if you get a 504 loan now, it will have payments made for the business until September. Is that correct? No, so there depending on when the loan closes and funds. When I say September, I think maybe what he's referencing is that it's before the end of the SBA's fiscal year, which ends technically on September 30th, but really it's like September 28th. Um, so <laughs> it just depends on what day of the week September 30th is. But um, but uh, in short, yeah. So you um, you would be eligible to receive the payments as long as the loan closed and funded between now and September 30th. Now remember, it has to be closed and funded. So getting getting approved is one thing. That doesn't mean the funds have been dispersed yet, right? There's still a closing process that occurs between you, your attorney, our attorney, uh, the bank's attorney. There's a lot of lot of lawyers involved. So <laughs> James, we're in March. What's we got six months, right? So yeah. when should someone expect to still be able to close a loan and benefit from that? Like right. so great. Great question. So SBA, so to, I want to differentiate 7As and 504s for one second, because this is a really important point, um, is that because the 504 is based on a bond sale, it happens once a month. So for example, if I wanted to be included to make a cutoff at the end of September, my loan, my 504 loan, would have to close and fund in the September debenture sale. So what that means is that I have to close request to ship which is us shipping off the phone the, the loan to be sold in the bond sale no later than august 18th to meet september there's a cutoff in the middle of each month to make sure that you meet the next month's bond sale, if that makes sense so if you're doing a 504 your drop dead date to be able to close and fund is approximately august 18th to make the september debenture sale right but then they're not there's nothing to benefit the payments starting october 1 at this point. right so no well so so the loan closed and funded and they would receive those payments but if i closed on in september and my bond my, my 504 was sold in the october bond sale you're not getting any of the payments okay okay Beth, does the sba offer loans for exports yes we have a special export finance loan program which will guarantee up to 90 percent of uh loans and we work closely with the state on their step program to help people do expansion so the capital in the uh program is goes from every anything that you need from new equipment to technology to whatever you need to um do an export uh uh to, to pivot your program into exports and we have a special loan officer which I can connect someone to or Andrew do you work with uh, Ed Eccles um, he oh, is yeah. dedicated to this loan program so if they're interested uh, please contact Andrew or Robin and um, and uh, we'll put them in touch with the right people and do you work on uh, Andrew, do you work on getting businesses ready to export and ready for that program? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think we have um, kind of a very vibrant group of advisors statewide that really help in this regard. So there are, you know, lots of opportunities, both from a finance perspective as well as, um, you know, translation opportunities in terms of thinking about how to make sure your materials 
uh, relevant and appropriate uh, for the market that you're trying to reach into. Uh, we also have, I should make sure I kind of reference that, that we've got a, a dynamic research network uh, that provides uh, market data um, to kind of help you quantify and kind of look at what the market conditions are um, when you're kind of exploring or kind of considering what um, export market you might want to consider getting into. So the long answer is yes. Short answer is yes, I suppose. But uh, yeah, we'd be uh, very happy to uh, expanding you some of your experts. Okay, so if there are questions from Renee, uh, Robin, and Andrew, and you know, we can help out on that. Okay, absolutely. And if you're confused about who to contact, just reply to your go to webinar email, and that will go to Pace and they'll get you to the right person. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Can I ask two more questions? All right, do all these loan programs require personal guarantees, or would that change if the business is a cooperative? So uh, I'm going to just jump on that for one second. So SBA requires any and all owners with 20% ownership or more to provide a personal guarantee. There's no way around that. Um, so, but with regard to worker cooperatives, just from a structural standpoint, we would more than likely have everybody provide a personal guarantee that's an owner in the business because a worker cooperative by nature is owned by employees and doesn't exist without the function of every employee that's there. Okay, thank you. Shelly, if you have any follow-ups on that one, just let me know. If you have a current 7A loan, is it possible to convert your SBA loan to a variable rate if it is currently a fixed rate with the same bank so you can navigate through these challenging times? Is that up to the bank exclusively or would it require the SBA approval and would there be additional fees? Robin, is that a better one to take offline? Robin? We, uh, what about the bankers? What are they doing on that? The, 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 short, the short answer is it depends on the bank. Um, right. and, and depending on, I can tell you at least for a 504, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. It's fixed for the life of the loan. For 7A, it can be possible depending on the lender. But again, that's really bank specific. James, so aren't you, do, aren't you doing refinancing? So we, uh... Yes. So we can do we can do the 504 refinance, but we are we're not doing um that, that's that's a little bit different, right? So it's you can't you but you also cannot use a 504 refi to refinance a 7A. No, so, I understand, but in your particular case, are you are doing 504 refinancing? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, we're we're also doing the 504 refinance program, which is refinancing existing uh, conventional debt that's associated with a uh, building and machinery and equipment. Um, good, real quick plug for that is that uh, originally the the minimum criteria is that the debt had to be two years old or older. However, due to some of the recent changes in legislation, the debt is now six months or older and it is eligible. Amongst amongst other eligibility criteria. Okay, so it's always worth asking the question, Brianna. What do you do about somebody who comes in who wants to change in terms and conditions on their seven A loan? Um, I'd say it's generally pretty difficult to refinance SBA with SBA, and nearly or not entirely doable. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are rules around like the exposure that a bank can reduce or the liability that we can reduce for ourselves if we refinance our own debt or our own SBA debt. So it's difficult. What I see more often is one bank uh, refinancing an SBA loan that was taken out with a different bank. Um, so, I mean, we've certainly done that. We refinance other uh, banks' SBA loans, but we don't really see it the other way around. <laughs> Okay, and Leonard, do you have any advice on what you do with someone who's seeking a terms changes in terms of, or conditions of the the seven A loan? So we don't do seven A, but we had questions on community advantage during this uh, uh, pandemic. So there was a question somebody asked uh, uh, a cab drivers asked to have a, a a longer term and a lower interest. So, but then so we, we, we discussed it, we didn't do anything yet. So, but now, now, now it's being paid for a few months by SBA. So, so we, we, we don't have much of experience on that one because our program is pretty new on that one. Right, one more thing I should say is in order to benefit from the 7A payments, the loans have to be taken out of deferment and be Put back into regular status. So somebody who asked that question, Renee, if they're still paying their SBA loan, 
they may want to contact their lens or, or check whether the, a lot of people in the pandemic, you know, things were really uh, hit in New York in uh, March and April, put their loans into uh, a deferred status or, or, or forbearance, and they need to take them out. And under the last version of the uh, American Recovery Plan, uh, they were capped, the payments are capped at $9,000 uh, for principal and interest. And if your payment is over that, in order to get the 9,000, and you, let's say your payment's 10,000, you have to make the $1,000 payment in order to capture the 9,000 uh, that's being what. Um, so people should check that out and see what they're doing. Because a lot of people hit that deferment or forbearance button and haven't thought about their loans, but in order to get this benefit, they have to be in current status. Okay, thank you. And I know I missed some questions, and I know there were some that were a little bit specific that I, I'm going to recommend um, go through a business advisor, but we'll do an export of these after, and we'll make sure if we missed any, we will get back to you. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to just tell folks to fill out the survey, but if you or anybody in the panel has anything to say before we shut down, I will let you. Can I just say, I see people are hitting my LinkedIn with very specific questions. And while I would love to be able to answer them, I just can't, but I want you to get answers to your questions. So if you can please send them through to the SBDC and they will decide what the best uh, uh, answer and solution or help for you, I would appreciate that. Um, and I'm sorry, but you know, there, that I can't answer everyone individually. Um, through that uh, medium. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, uh, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, a lot of the, the focus we do about sessions like this are really kind of giving you, uh, kind of the participants, kind of a, a broad-based understanding of the programs and how they may be beneficial for you. You know, we had, uh, you know, many, many folks participating today, and each of you have kind of your own set of circumstances around your specific business. and. I think that's really why we encourage folks to kind of transition, um, kind of learn and, and, and take from this session, you know, that hopefully this is kind of a resource that will be beneficial to you uh, as a specific business owner, and then think about how you can apply it. And that's really why we encourage you to kind of uh, work with a business advisor, um, help understand the ramifications for it, then you'd know, ultimately use us as a conduit to help kind of connect with, you know, the terrific lenders and others out there that we work with um extensively kind of here in the new york city area and then for my colleagues um you know who run centers elsewhere in the state they have also kind of connections to um very solid and community-based lenders in those areas as well so you know certainly take advantage of and work with the, the sbc in your community because they know the those areas best absolutely and there's some really good links that we put out in the chat the lender match the locating resources the counseling form if you miss any of those just shoot us an email and we'll we'll get you connected but i think we're in good shape unless we have anything else with that i'll say thank you to the panelists thank you andrew and pace for hosting and as usual it's been a blast take care everyone thank you.